Massive protests in Hong Kong may have saved Taiwan from a Chinese military invasion, at least for now. Welcome back to China Uncensored, I'm Chris Chappell. Joining me again is Ian Easton, Senior Director of Project 2049 Institute and an expert on Taiwan and Asia security issues. Thanks for joining me again. Chris, it's a great pleasure. Thanks for having me back. Well, so the first time I had you on back in 2018, we talked about China's 2020 plan to be ready to invade Taiwan. And now it's a few weeks until 2020. Is China still going ahead with that or do they need a 2021 plan? That's a very good question. So I've been thinking about this issue, and I checked, and the 13th five-year plan, which they're on now, mm -hmm. doesn't actually end until the end of 2020. Oh. But, Why'd you tell me that last time? Well, I didn't know. Oh. But having said that, I'm still skeptical that the PLA is going to be ready uh, in time. I think that if Xi Jinping were to order the PLA to invade Taiwan today or even next year, there's a high probability of failure on his part. I think he would lose. Uh, the question is, does he know that? I mean, he's a dictator, so are his generals going to tell him the truth? If yeah, he decides, now's the time. Well, so with the trade war and a slowing economy and the, and the situation in Hong Kong, do you think with, all of, with China distracted by all of that, that might let Taiwan off the hook? I think in the near term, it probably will. Um, most countries... Uh, even countries as powerful as China has become, prefer to deal with, with one crisis at a time uh, or to at least minimize the number of crises they have to deal with at a time. Uh, and so I would expect that as long as Hong Kong is very problematic right now and as long as the United States continues to show that it's truly serious about strategic competition with China, as we've seen with the, the trade war and, and with other a more competitive uh, posturing that the Trump administration has taken, I think it's unlikely that uh, China is going to attempt the invasion of Taiwan uh, in the near future. Although, you know, that's, that's speculative. Nobody knows the future, and, and certainly my, my beliefs could be falsified by events, but uh, I, I would not expect that to happen in the very near future. It's more of a longer-term threat. Okay, so in the long term, is Taiwan still a flashpoint? Oh, absolutely. I think Taiwan is, is arguably the most dangerous flashpoint on the planet. And it's going to become more dangerous over time uh, for a variety of reasons. Such as? Uh, so China is, is growing its military power. And as China increases its military power, uh, and as Taiwan's own military uh, defensive power and the United States power in the region, uh, in a comparative sense, starts to diminish over time, that is going to make uh, Taiwan a much more attractive uh, target for CCP expansionism. Well, I know lately there's been a lot of uh, traffic in the Taiwan Strait. Why is it so popular? You mean traffic in terms of the Chinese military? Oh. Or, or the U.S. There's Navy? There's the U.S. Navy, there's the Chinese Navy. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, a few weeks ago, Taiwan's Minister of National Defense, Yen Defa, testified before Taiwan's, Taiwan's parliament that they had tracked uh, over 2,000 Chinese flights in the Taiwan Strait area over the past 12 months. Wow. And that they expected that trend to continue or possibly increase. And that included uh, Chinese bombers that are circling Taiwan, Chinese intelligence aircraft, Chinese fighter planes, and also a lot of drones. Mm -hmm. And so what we're likely to see in the coming months is China ramping up its air and naval activity around Taiwan in order to uh, exhaust Taiwan's military. So for every Taiwanese, um, excuse me, for every Chinese sortie around Taiwan, the Taiwanese uh, Air Force has to respond. They have to scramble their, their fighter aircraft to go um, respond to it. When you see a blip on your radar screen coming at you, you can't identify from the radar screen itself what that is. And so that's why Taiwan has to scramble fighter aircraft so they can actually get visual identification to see if it's a drone or a bomber or something else. Well, every time they do that, that disrupts their, their pilot training. Uh, it's a lot of resources that they're expending in terms of fuel and manpower. And over time, that has the potential to significantly weaken 
Taiwan's Air Force uh, and their Navy as well to the extent that they're responding to all the Chinese naval activity around Taiwan. Um, they've done the same to Japan around the Senkaku Islands. They've done the same to countries in the South China Sea. Uh, some people call it gray zone operations. Um, and we can certainly expect that they're going to do that. Well, they're already doing that to Taiwan. Gray zone meaning? Uh, meaning it, it's hostile, mm -hmm. but nobody's, nobody's getting shot. Okay, so pushing it's things to the brink of it's, war. But you're not. pushing it to the brink of war mm -hmm. um, in a very calculated fashion, but not going over the brink. Hmm. Well, so what about uh, U.S. arms sales to Taiwan? Because there's been some record-breaking numbers this past year. Yeah, so the Trump administration has responded to some of the Chinese coercion against Taiwan uh, with arms sales. So we've um, notified to Congress the sale of new tanks to Taiwan. I think that's 108 new uh, Abrams uh, main battle tanks, which are the most advanced tank uh, on the market. And then also new F-16 fighter jets, 66 of them, which is enough for about three squadrons. Mm. Um, and that's a very significant um, announcement because the United States since the 1990s as a matter of policy has has not sold Taiwan uh, new fighter jets. Mm -hmm. So there was a, an announcement of a sale in 1992 which was fulfilled around 1997-98 but since then there have been no new fighter jets sold to Taiwan because f uh, fighter aircraft are considered a strategic asset mm -hmm. um, and so this was something that the Bush administration shied away from, the Obama administration shied away from it and now this, the Trump administration has taken uh, sort of a new tack and has decided, no, Taiwan really needs those fighter jets. Uh, so that's, that's one of several things the administration has done to try to shore up Taiwan's defensive position. But uh, overall, it's a really challenging uh, situation that Taiwan faces. Mm -hmm. And there's no amount of arms sales that the U.S. can provide. I mean, no matter how much Taiwan spends on its defense, uh, it'll never keep up with the threat that they face. Well, what other kind of support is the U.S. giving to Taiwan? How is it doing? Uh, well, there's a range of things that the United States government has started to do uh, in terms of sending high-level officials to Taiwan. So, for example, the State Department has been very good about sending uh, Deputy Assistant Secretaries of State to Taiwan, um, in some cases very publicly, and they participate in, in open forum, they give public speeches, they meet with the president of Taiwan, uh, and they do so in an unabashed way. Uh, we've also recently seen the, the Pentagon do the same thing. They sent an official of the same rank. It's a civilian equivalent to a two-star, maybe three-star general who just went to Taiwan for the first time um, for private meetings there on defense issues. These type of moves uh, may seem, they may seem small, but when you compare them to where we were just two or three years ago, mm -hmm. that was almost unthinkable. So these are things previous administrations have not done. Previous administrations uh, never even seriously considered doing anything like that. Mm -hmm. They were terrified of, of what Beijing's reaction might be, uh, and they allowed themselves to, uh, I guess, be intimidated. And so they would not send any officials uh, over the rank of a colonel to Taiwan. And so sending a two-star general equivalent is pretty significant. And the United States has also sent um, actual uniformed military officers to Taiwan. Uh, and we've started to do regular patrols of the Taiwan Strait and to make that public as well. And so there are a number of, of steps that the government has taken to try to support Taiwan because, again, Taiwan by itself uh, is in a very, very difficult situation. There's no way they can keep a favorable military or political balance across the Taiwan Strait. Um, and so, you know, if you asked me what kind of grade the, the Trump administration uh, deserves, this is something we've talked about in the past, mm -hmm. I would say that compared to the Obama administration or uh, the Bush administration before it or the Clinton administration before it, the Trump administration probably deserves an A plus wow. in terms of support for Taiwan. But there's another way to look at it. Mm -hmm. Is it enough? Mm. Is the Trump administration keeping up with the pace of the threat against Taiwan? Is it keeping up with the changing facts on the ground? And there, I think the administration would would have to deserve a, a much lower grade. Mm -hmm. um, 
because it is very, very difficult to keep up with uh, all the things that China is doing that are directed at, at Taiwan, and by, by extension, uh, the United States as well. So what do you think the U.S. could be doing to earn an, a solid A, at least an A? Well, it would be difficult. I, I think there's a lot of inertia that builds up after 40 years of uh, executing a certain policy. Mm -hmm. um, it's policy is not something, as I understand it from the outside, it's just as a researcher, it's not something that, that you can turn on a dime. Mm -hmm. um, and so for 40 years, our policy has been to keep Taiwan at, at a distance mm -hmm. and to, in many ways, make our Taiwan policy uh, through Beijing um, to constantly be calculating, you know, if I do this with Taiwan, what will that mean for U.S.-China relations? What will Beijing's reaction be? There's still a lot of that mentality, I think, uh, in many places across the bureaucracy, but it is changing. And so if we fast forward uh, to the future, to 2025 or to 2030, what we might expect to see would be not only U.S. patrols in the Taiwan Strait, but regular U.S. Uh, ship visits to Taiwan mm. and to have ships uh, in Taiwanese ports, to have troops in Taiwan, perhaps um, a few thousand troops on a rotational basis, to have military exercises with the Taiwanese military, uh, both uh, at the training ranges in Taiwan and the United States, to see regular exchanges of high-level um, visitors from the United States to Taiwan, all the way up to the four-star level mm -hmm. and their civilian uh, equivalents, um, and to be moving towards a much more normalized diplomatic uh, relationship with Taiwan. I think absent that, the probability of a major, very dangerous crisis or, or, or even a war across the Taiwan Strait is, is very high over the next 10 years. So. What, is, what was the concern people had about what China would do to the U.S. or Taiwan if the U.S. shows more support? You know, that's one of the things that, that's funny about fear mm -hmm. is sometimes people are, are the most afraid of the unknown. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, people didn't know. You know, if you're a diplomat at the State Department and your boss asks you, what can I expect from China if I go visit Taiwan, for example? or if I write this letter you know, in support of, of something Taiwan's doing, or if I say something uh, at the United Nations or something of that, of that nature, um, in many cases, a diplomat couldn't tell you. They wouldn't know. But there was a fear of, well, you know, they could do this, they could do that, they could do the other thing, um, and none of it would be particularly pleasant. Uh, in many cases, it would be as simple as, as an angry phone call. And over time, a demarche or an angry letter from the, the PRC embassy here in Washington. And over time, that seemed to, at least in some cases, have a certain, um, a certain way of almost conditioning people in the U.S. government to anticipate in advance what the Chinese Communist Party wanted and then to give it to them, uh, or conversely, to anticipate what they didn't want and then to avoid that. It's hard to imagine that the U.S. government could be turned by an angry letter from Beijing. Not one, but if you imagine hundreds of thousands of them mm. over a 40-year relationship mm. um, combined with, you know, meetings that are canceled, combined with getting the cold shoulder at a summit, all these things have an effect. It also has an effect when you have so many former U.S. government officials um, making a lot of money in China or in Hong Kong through their business connections with the Chinese Communist Party. That also has obviously an effect as well. So what has the Chinese reaction been to this higher level of U.S. support for Taiwan? Chris, that is a really, really good question. Um, in many ways, their reaction has not been nearly as terrifying as I think what many people, people argued it would be. Um, Certainly, this was something people uh, worried a lot about. You know, what would their reaction be? And I think those that worried a lot have probably been a little disappointed or maybe now are relieved to see that the United States can do much more in support of Taiwan uh, and not set off a potential uh, crisis in the Taiwan Strait.
How do you think the protests in Hong Kong have impacted Taiwan? Well, I think they've served as a wake-up call for many people in Taiwan. You know, for the past 20 years, those in Taiwan that favored a closer relationship with Beijing uh, argued that, that Hong Kong was a success story, mm -hmm. that actually Hong Kong showed that you could be annexed by the Chinese Communist Party the way Hong Kong was back in 97, and the results would not be so bad. And you know anybody who had visited Hong Kong before this year, certainly before 2014, would say this, this is a very pleasant city state, very well run, very wealthy, uh, it had a lot of great things going for it. And so there were those in Taiwan who said, hey, maybe one country, two systems is not so bad. Maybe that could work for us too. Certainly that's what the Chinese Communist Party wanted uh, to promote and it's something they did promote very heavily across the Taiwan Strait. Sort of like if the U.S. isn't giving us much support and the alternative is war and invasion from China, why not do this seemingly better alternative of one country, two system? Exactly. If the, United, the, the sense, I think, for, for some politicians in Taiwan was that the United States had abandoned them in 1979 when we switched diplomatic relations and went with the PRC and not the, the ROC, the Republic of China. Uh, you know, because previously, before 1979, Taiwan was a, an ally of the United States. We had diplomatic relations, we had an embassy in Taipei, we had troops in Taiwan. Um, we, had, we guaranteed Taiwan's security. After that, there was a deep sense of betrayal. And there were those that said, well, the international community no longer recognizes us as a real country. The United States is keeping us at a distance. Uh, China is threatening us with war if we go fully independent. And so we have no alternative other than to do a lot of business with China. And ultimately, maybe the best deal we could get would be a Hong Kong plus maybe something even better than, than what Hong Kong had. And so there was, there was a number of people in Taiwan that, that held this view. I think it was a relatively small number. I think it was a, a minority of people, perhaps a small minority. Um, but that group has really diminished in size over the past six months because um, if, you know, people around the world can now see that the Chinese Communist Party doesn't keep its promises. Mm -hmm. And you can, you, we're all being uh, exposed to uh, image after image of extreme police brutality and unprofessional behavior. Uh, and a lot of, you know, report after report, including reports from China Uncensored, have shown that um, Hong Kong is not a model that anybody else in the right mind would want to follow. And so I think it really has served as a wake-up call for Taiwan. And I think it's probably influencing uh, the current presidential elections uh, as well. Mm -hmm. Any predictions for the 2020 election in Taiwan? Well, um, Taiwan's going to have a, its next presidential elections in, on January 11th of 2020, uh, which is coming up fast. Mm -hmm. And currently, um, uh, President Tsai Ing-wen of the DPP uh, appears to have a significant advantage uh, over Han Goyu, her, her KMT uh, opponent, probably in part because she has taken a much stronger position uh, standing up for Taiwanese uh, sovereignty and standing up uh, for you know, things like democracy and support of the protesters uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, whereas the other political party seems to have more mixed messages mm -hmm. on that. And so I think uh, this is something that is, has uh, spoken to uh, a fair number of people in Taiwan, although polls can be misleading, and certainly that's what the polls would say today. I think she's up uh, about 30 points over her opposition. Mm -hmm. um, but s polls can be misleading, and you never know uh, what ultimately will happen here in a few weeks when people in Taiwan go to the polls. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, we'll have to check in again in uh, 2021 to see about the 2020 plan. Sounds good. Thanks for having me, Chris. Great.